So today, as I said, I'm actually doing this all on my own. So if you guys have questions, um, feel free to write them in along the way. And also at the bottom of your live, you should be able to see two, I guess one has a question mark on it. And if you click that, you can type your question in there also, so it'll pop up. But if I miss any of your questions, um, let me know and I will try to answer as many as I can. Oh good, white wine glass today. So I've talked about it before. Um, it's not advised to use a flute when tasting champagne. A flute is fine for a celebration if it's New Year's Eve or you know a party, then of course a flute is absolutely fine. Um, but normally you could use a tulip glass or a white wine glass. And today I have more of a tulip shape. So I'll start with some history of the champagne. And again, for those that are just joining, we are going over Champagne Tatinje today. And this is their Brut. Um, in the US it's called Brut La Frances, but if you're in other parts of the world, it might be something different. So if it's something that fit on your bottle, let us know. So the start of the house, um, this house was founded in 1734. So it's one of the first champagne houses to be started. So the first champagne house was in 1729. So within five years, um, Tatin J was founded and it was actually founded by another family. And this family, it's on the bottle, it's Fourneau Forest, Forest Fourneau. Um, so he founded the bottle, his family. And um, during World War I, um, Pierre Tatin J came um, came, he was uh, in the army and came and was stationed um, at the chateau. So the chateau is called Folie de la Marqueterie. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. If anyone knows French, I totally, totally butchered it. Um, but that's the chateau he was based in and he fell in love with the chateau and he said that he was gonna buy the chateau one day. Um, so that's during World War War. World War One, um, and then after World War One, there was the depression, um, you know, economic crisis, a lot going on. So Forrest Fourneau had to sell the company. So Tatin J bought the company at this time. So Tatin J took over in 1932, and then took over the house, um, and they bought up a lot of land with it. So Tatin J today owns 288 hectares of land, which is about 700 acres, I wanna say, of land in the Champagne region. And they have vineyards all throughout the region. So the Cote de Blanc, which is um, you know where Chardonnay is known, and this is because of the chalky soil. So they bought land there, they have the Valle de la Marne. This is where the Pinot Mune is um, due to the sandy soils in this area. Then they also have um, land in the Montaigne de Rims and the Aube, and both of these regions are known for Pinot Noir. So they have a land in all, th all the different regions to source their grapes. Um, they also buy fruit from other um, areas as they um, produce a lot of champagne. So they're one of the top five producers, I wanna say, of champagne. So in order to get enough grapes, they do buy grapes as well, as own their own um, vineyards. So that's kind of a, ba a brief background of the house. Um, so I wanted to also talk about, well, I kind of tore him off, but um, I have another bottle. So if you guys have a bottle or if you've seen the bottle before, this is the symbol and you can find this on all their champagnes and there's also one down here the same the same guy um so who is this guy this guy was the comte de champagne or the count of champagne and his name was Thibault the fourth um and he was born in troyes which is in um southern the southern part of Cham the champagne region and when he was born his father passed away within either right before or right after he was born. So when he was 21, he automatically became the count at a young age. So why is Tatin J, you know, showing 
the count on their labels, um, and they also have the Comte de Champagne, which is their Tete de Cuvée, um, and it's called Comte de Champagne, the Count de Champagne. So Thibault liked to travel, and he went to the um, eastern part of the world, and he brought back uh, the, a rose, the rose, a, a type of rose. I don't remember this, the exact rose. So he brought back the rose, and then he also bought, brought back um, one of the vines that would, not the Chardonnay vari um, varietal, but another like parent varietal of Chardonnay. So he brought that back to the Champagne region. So this is why the house kind of pays tribute to the Count of Champagne because of their, um, they are a Champagne focused house and they're paying tribute to that Count. Also, the Count um, had this beautiful house um, in the medieval times where they would watch you know, shows and they saw the King's coronations from this place. And then Tati J also owns this building to this day. Um, so if you're in Rems, you could go, I don't know if you could visit the building. I didn't get a chance to do it, but um, that's something I'm sure we can find out. Um, so that's kind of the history of the Count. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. If not, I'll go on. Um, I have some notes. Since I'm doing this by myself, I wanted to be prepared for you guys. So another thing about the house. Um, so the chateau, as I mentioned, um, it's called the, I guess, marquetry or the Chateau de la Marquetry. Um, and that's because of the design of the vines. Um, so it, you know, they turn different colors and it kind of looks like design work. Um, and that's where that name come from. And Tatin J also has um, a champagne just from these vines. Um, so it's the vines for this single vineyard, um, which is uncommon in champagne because as you guys know, or if you don't know, champagne is normally a blend of the three main grapes, um, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Meunier. So it's not as common for houses to have a single vineyard vari uh, varietal or single vineyard growth champagne. And this is because the weather in Champagne is very cold. So the average temperature is probably 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. And there's lots of frost in Champagne as well. So there's, I think it's 60 to 80 days of frost a year. And depending on the timing of the frost, it could ruin bud growth. Um, it has lots of effects on the vines. So it's important kind of why, you know, Champagne became this blended cuvee um, was kind of like an insurance policy. They needed to make sure they were able to grow Champagne, you know, each, each season, each harvest. And if it was just on one vineyard or one grape, this could, you know, lead to um, not being able to produce enough of Champagne or maybe having um, variations in the Champagne. So talking about variations now, let's go into the house style. And again, if you're just joining, again, this is the champagne we're going over today. This is the Tatin J Non-Vintage Brute. So this is a blend, I'll hold it up. It's a blend of 40% Chardonnay, which is a higher percentage of Chardonnay. Um, than a lot of houses. So they are a champagne or a Chardonnay focused house. Um, so it's 40% Chardonnay, 25% Pinot Meunier, and then the remainder, I think that's 35% is Pinot Noir. So that's the blend of their non-vintage brute that they make um, year in and year out. And again, the non-vintage is a blend of multiple years. Um, and for that, um, a lot of or the champagne houses put in reserve wines. Um, but Tatin J uses lower, younger reserve wines. So their reserve wines aren't aged a lot. So they wanna keep that freshness with these champagnes. Um, these are elegant and fresh. <coughs> um, so they, they wanna keep that freshness and this is why they use a younger age of the reserve wines. Um, so now, I don't know if anyone's drinking it with me, but I'll, we'll take, smell it and taste it. So, and again, it's a nice, for those who don't have it, it's a nice golden color. You can see, I think, yeah, you guys can see those fine bubbles. 
And the bubbles become finer um, the longer aging. You know, the longer that champagne ages, the finer the bubbles usually become. So there's a nice nose, very elegant. Oh, Gina has hers. Hi, Gina. If anyone else has yours, let me know what you're smelling. So it's very fruit forward. I would say there's like peach. And then there's also that brioche or toasty flavor, that bread flavor. So the bread flavor, I just wanted to explain for those who don't know, that comes from the aging on the lees. So the lees are the dead yeast that are fermented in the bottle. And um, in Champagne, the, the second fermentation is in the bottle, which, is a, which it's served in. So yeah, vanilla, peach, floral, some white blossom. So I love this champagne. I mean, I've had it before, but I get a lot of honey from this one. I don't know if anyone else kind of gets a hint of honey, but I really like that flavor for this champagne. And then maybe some like apple um, and that peach again. So yes, it's a very yummy champagne. So let's talk more. Maybe the honey comes from the Chardonnay. Yeah, the honey flavors can come from the Chardonnay. So the Chardonnay grape is also the most high in acidity as well. So this is also going to be a little more, um, there's more acidity to it and that freshness. So I also want to talk more about the house. Um, yes, it is a yummy champagne. And I actually got to visit the house when I went to Rennes for my first trip in December. So it was an amazing time, a great visit. And you got to go, It's a, I definitely recommend it. So they own the Crayers. So the Crayers, if I'm pronouncing this right, it's the chalk, the Roman, Gallo Roman Chalk Queries. So at the, at the beginning of Champagne's history, the Romans came in. And yes, I very much enjoyed my trip. It was amazing. Um, yay. <laughs> um, the, so the Romans came in and built these chalk quarries. Um, and the chalk quarries are used for building. Um, so you could still go to Champagne and see some of the Roman architecture. But um, it, tur it turns to stone, so it's a good building tool. And this is what the Romans were digging out um, and using to build, build the city. So um, Tatin J is one of the few, there's under 10, I think there's five to six champagne houses who have the crayers, or cray, <laughs> I'm really bad at the pronunciation, the chalk quarries is what I'll say. And they're 18 meters below the ground. So you have to go down a lots of steps to get to the bottom and kind of the whole experience, you walk up, um, it's this nice gated um, champagne house. You go in, you start your tour, you actually see a video talking about the history and the count. So you learn a lot about that. And then you go on the tour. So that you go 18 meters below ground. So 18 meters below ground, uh, it's kind of funny. It's actually about, you know, 10 degrees. And this 10 degrees, I kind of think it's a theme. It's, it, it's like the temperature it's outside is usually around 10 degrees. Um, down in the caves, it's usually 10 degrees. And then again, the serving temperature um, for champagne is 10 degrees. And this is Celsius, sorry guys. So that's 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so as the 10 degrees, your way and deep in these caves and the caves just kind of go on um, for miles. I mean, they're huge. I didn't walk the entire, the entire um, chalk quarries, but they're, they're just massive. They're so cool to see. 
Um, you kind of see different places where they would do um, mass um, and do religious orders. And then you also get to see, um, you know, just the history, just walking through. It's like, oh my gosh, this is an underground city. So it was just really cool to see that and experience that. And then also the Comte de Champagne, which is the Tête de Cuvée, is being aged down in these cellars. So you get to see the aging process of this champagne, which is incredible. Um, and then after doing this, so it's kind of, it's cool and humid um, in, these, in these cellars. And actually going, I went in December and it was a lot cooler um, or actually it was probably a little warmer than the temperature outside. So it's kind of nice if you go in the winter to get down in the, in the caves. Um, so I got to experience that and it was amazing. And after you do a tasting, so, um, Champagne Tatinje not only has obviously their non-vintage brew, but they also do, um, a rosé and they do, what, um, they do, Rosé, they do a vintage, and they do the Tete Cuvée, the Comte de Champagne, which is a hundred, that's a, they're, that vintage is 100% Blanc de Blanc. So it's 100% Chardonnay. And then they also do a Rosé version as well. So that will include the Pinot Noir. So this is um, a range. They also have Demi Sec. Um, it's called Nocturne, um, or is it Sec? But they have they have different ranges and different options to choose from um, when you're trying their champagne. And again, like I said, they also have that Folie de la Mar Marquette, uh, which is their single vineyard champagne. So that's a fun one to try too, if you can find it. Um, but I mean, the range is incredible. Um, so that's more on the house. And I also wanted to share uh, more about the his, a little more about the history. So Tatin J also bought vineyards in California. So if anyone's, I mean, Champagne might be a little far and especially after these times, if you need a road trip, if you're in California or on the West Coast, um, Domain Carneros is um, the sparkling wine house hold um, owned by Champagne Tatin J and that's in Sonoma. So I don't know if anyone's been, um, but I've been and it's incredible. And that actually Chateau, um, is supposed to look like, or is built after the Chateau in Champagne. So if you go there, it's a beautiful, gorgeous French Chateau, um, French Chateau and there's beautiful grounds. Okay, then the Nocturne Champagnes are set champagne. So there's 18 grams of sugar per liter in the set champagne. Um, so it will be a little sweeter, but it's not gonna be too sweet. I'm actually gonna try that later this week. Um, so hopefully you guys can join me on Friday, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, so yes, Carneros, they're um, Domain Carneros. And um, it's a beautiful place to do a tasting, kind of sit, enjoy the afternoon, especially on a sunny day. I mean, the views are incredible. The chateau is incredible. You can get some really great pictures. Um, everyone's super friendly at the property. Um, and I actually have a bottle just to guys show you. So if you see, um, this is kind of the label. So if you wanna, if you see that, this is also, you can see it says by Tatin J on it. So this is their California sparkling wine. Um, so yeah, if you need a road trip, I definitely recommend it until we could get back on a, on a plane to go to Champagne. Um, I hope we can get to do that soon. Um, beautiful place and fun to work, very clean, organized production area. Yes, it is a gorgeous place. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend doing that. I'll probably do a road trip, hopefully, uh, as soon as we can. I don't know if anyone else is feeling a little, I don't know, confined, you know, we're super confined. I, it'll be great once we're able to get out again um, and go wine tasting. Um, so that's Domain Carneros. And then also, um, it's not released yet, but they do have vines um, or vineyard area in Kent in England. So I think I have a couple friends from England if they're still on. Um, so they also bought land there. I don't know when that will be open um, to the public to go wine tasting, but the first vintage is supposed to be released in 2024, I believe. Um, 
So that's really exciting. And um, English sparkling wine is kind of becoming uh, more and more popular uh, due to global warming. So they're able to create some really nice sparkling wines. So Tati and Jay saw the, you know, the opportunity and believes that, you know, they can produce great wines there. So they're expanding there too. So that'll be another great place to visit. So kind of, um, you know, they have different um, areas around the world where they've um, invested in. But of course, um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the champagne, but and their sparkling wines are amazing too. Um, so now I know we've been talking about the brute. And for anyone who's new, this is the champagne we've been talking about. So I also want to talk about the house and that I'm kind of jumping all over the place. Um, but the house also is really into the arts and um, gastronomy. So of course, champagne can be paired with multiple things. I know a lot of people think of champagne kind of as an aperitif um, or, you know, just have a toast as a celebration. But champagne, um, especially a range like Tatin J, where they have a range of products um, or champagnes that they produce, um, you can pair this champagne through the entirety of your meal. So of course you could start with an aperitif. Um, you can then kind of progress your way. And of course, I don't know if who, everyone who follows me, I'm sure you know, I love uh, champagne and french fries and I've definitely had Tatin J with french fries. Highly recommend that. Um, but you could also obviously have this with Fish, um, so sashimi would be great, I think. Um, I was also thinking like oysters Rockefeller will be kind of, would be kind of fun, like the fried oyster um, would probably go really well with this. Um, also the rosés, um, you can pair with different things. So rosés can kind of stand up. Um, that Pinot Noir provides more structure to those champagnes. So they can kind of stand up to like maybe even a, a salmon or, um, like a roasted chicken. Um, so there's different food pairings that you can talk about. And I'm actually going to talk about this more on Friday. Um, I'll have more of their champagnes to show you guys. Um, and I'll kind of talk through all the different pairings. But I just kind of wanted to highlight that really quick on some ideas. And I don't know any of you guys, if you have a favorite pairing, like let us know. We'll definitely um, share that. Um, of course, I think anything fried is good. <laughs> Not best for the diet, but it tastes really good. Um, so I also, okay, so they're very into food. So they started this organization um, with chefs um, and it's kind of this competition that they hold every year. So they come and they um, host this competition for food and then the winning chef um, gets a prize. I've actually need to learn more about this, um, you guys. So I can share that later. Maybe I'll do a blog post and talk about it. Would it go with fajitas? I think yes. I think rosé would go really well with Mexican. Well, does go really well with Mexican food. Um, but even the brute, you could probably do, um, you know, probably not as spicy, but you could definitely do, or shrimp fajitas would be probably really good. Um, but I definitely think the rosé would stand up to Mexican food very well also. Um, so in addition, they love the art. So in 1983, they released um, this kind of art collection of these bottles. So in, um, they do their vintage year. So the vintage year is just one harvest year. And um, they'll do a partner with a different artist. Um, to commission them to um, either like paint, paint on the bottle or kind of make the bottle look like art. Um, so it's called the Art Collection if you guys want to look it up. It's really cool. I mean, I think they're so incredible. Um, just the bottle and then you know it's a great vintage that are going in there because not all the vintage, I mean, all the vintages are great, but like I'll say it, uh, even a phenomenal vintage is going into these um, artistic bottles and I actually have one for you guys that I got when I visited because I just thought it was so cool um, so like I said I went and then I saw this and if you know 
or you may or may not know, but I love leopards. So there's this beautiful leopard case. Hello, hi everyone. Um, I know more people are joining, um, but I wanted to show you guys this fun bottle. So here is the bottle, and this is the 2008 um, Tatin J collection. So if you don't know, um, 2008 is an extraordinary, extraordinary vintage for champagne. Um, so like I said, they pick these, uh, you know, different artists to do these bottles. Yeah, the bottle, I know, I love the bottle. It's like, I saw this, I could not not buy it. Um, so I had to buy it. Um, and this is actually the first time. So if you see, it's just a leper um, drinking water. Um, at night, uh, so the photographer, you know, had a light, you know, people with him, took him to Africa um, to take these photos. And it's a, I believe he's a Brazilian photographer. Um, and this is actually the first time that they put a photo photograph on the bottle. So usually it's um, like, you know, a painting or art drawn, but this is actually a, photo a photograph that they put on all these bottles. So yeah, it's very cool. And then it, you kind of see, it kind of goes around the whole bottle. Um, so I actually haven't tried their 2008 vintages, um, but I'm sure it's extraordinary. I'm kind of saving this one because it's so special. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to open it up for, um, but it's just really cool that I had to have it. So again, they have, um, if you see one of these, I definitely recommend, or if you visit the house, you'd be able to, to buy it because I, I think they're pretty hard to find. So um, they also have glasses, which I didn't bring my glass out, um, but I bought the glasses too. So they have glasses that, that match. So super cute, super cool. Um, kind of great that they incorporate the art with the champagne and, um, kind of bring this together. So they also have, on, oh, the Brazilian photographer is Sebastião Salgado. Um, and they, ha um, so Tatting J has on their website or YouTube, you can see an interview with him, kind of talking about the process and what inspires him in nature. Um, he says most of his, you know, shots are nature and the earth. Um, and he kind of talks about how he was able to get this fantastic shot. Um, and he only had one opportunity to get the shot because obviously once he took the, the photographer or the photograph, the leper just kind of, la you know, ran. So um, it's kind of amazing how, how cool it came out. And I definitely recommend, um, we love that bottle. I'm so happy to see. Yes, I love it too. Um, so yeah, I definitely think you guys should check this out. I mean, we have the time to, their website's really fun. They have a lot of great YouTube videos to Champagne Tatting J, which I like, and there's a lot to learn about the house. Um, so let me go on and share a couple other tidbits with you guys. So again, okay, we gotta go back to the count of champagne. How long will the champagne last in the fridge with a stopper in it? Um, I always say probably two, I would say two days, maybe three. You could probably do a little longer, but I think to get that freshness um, and character, you definitely, I always, I don't like to keep mine longer than two days. So I would say um, definitely have this one that we opened today by Tuesday um, to get you know the freshness from it for sure. Um, so let's talk about the count, and I brought that bottle to share with you guys too. So this is their Tete de Cuvée, um, and this is the 2007 vintage. Any industry people use inert glass, use inert gas to keep wine. Um, so this is their Tete de Cuvée, 100% Chardonnay. Um, so this comes from Grand Cru, the Grand Cru villages in the Cote de Blanc. Um, so it comes from five of the villages. 
And um, so it's a Grand Cru champagne. So for those who don't know, Grand Cru um, are, there's 17 Grand Cru villages throughout Champagne. And this has, uh, they were rated 100% of, you know, the kind of the best vines. And this came out in 1911. So, um, and this is still kind of standard today. It was, before it was used to set the price of grapes, but now it's just kind of, you know, Grand Cru Villages, um, you know you're getting great quality um, with the wines and a lot of champagne producers put them in their um, Tete de Cru Bays. Um, so this can age a very long time. So this is the 2007 here. Um, and I actually, I don't know if anyone on here has had what the oldest um, age uh, Comte de Champagne you guys had. Um, I think I've actually only had the 2007. Um, but I know that these can age a very long time. Chardonnay has the high acidity, which, um, you know, allows it to age for years to come. This could easily age for at least 10 more years, um, probably even longer. So again, this is the Tete de Cuvée. Um, so I think I'm kind of wrapping it up for today. I, I kind of just wanted to give you guys a, an overview of the champagne, talk about their non-vintage brute, which is again, this one. And you can find this on wine.com. I know we, a lot of us are ordering wine these days, so you can definitely find this on wine.com um, and some other websites. If you need help finding it, just let me know. Also, you know, once we could go out again, um, it's, it's, you could definitely find it um, at most retailers as well. And again, you could, it's usually about 40 to 50 US, um, depending on where you find it. Oh, also, you could get this one at Costco. So um, I know Costco has a lot of wine. So for those of you who shop at Costco, you, um, you can find it there easily. Um, so again, thank you guys all for joining. I don't know if anyone has any other questions or that there's anything else. Uh, yeah, it's a definitely a great price point. It's an amazing price point for the champagne. It's an excellent champagne. Um, this non-vintage, I mean, this is one I recommend um, for...